Good afternoon, dear friends. We are going to start our roundtable. We won't waste our time today. We have interesting speakers. We invited Fund of Democratic Initiatives, and they invited Alexander Vmodzik, Maxim Palomarchuk, Sergei Solotki, and uh, I will tell you more about them when we will give them the floor. And uh, I am Alexei Garany, the scientific director of the fund and the professor of Kiev McGill Academy. And we carried out a survey uh, about the attitude of people towards um, introduction of peacekeeping forces in Donbass. We had the national results and uh, we carried out the survey during three years in a row. And we have data for comparison. And I hope for interesting discussion in the context of laws that were adopted recently. And now I give the floor first to Irina Bikeshkina, head of uh, Democratic Initiative Foundation. And she will briefly outline the results. First, uh, we spoke about a national survey in 2015 and 2016. And, and next, uh, um, as we see from previous years, uh, the population on the whole support the introduction of international contingent in Donbass. And uh, the support grew from 2015 till 2016. The only region where the proponents and the opponents the, uh, was 50-50 was uh, south, 38 against and 36 for this. And I would like to say, if we are speaking about Donbass in 2015, negative uh, attitude prevailed, and in 2016, positive attitude prevailed. Uh, so what will be this year? And uh, this issue is acute, and uh, um, it was uh, we were not able to carry out a national survey. We um, surveyed the experts, those who deal with international problems and uh, are not affiliated with uh, institutions of power. Those who are at the uh, public council, at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, they have the opportunities to influence the decisions that they uh, are taken. So at least they can take part in discussions, at, le at least they are heard. So they, their opinion is really important about the overall results. Um, the experts unanimously uh, said that uh, it is good to introduce contingent to the Lugansk and Donetsk Oblast territories. About the um, uh, possibilities, the majority of experts believe that this is not realistic. And the smaller part of experts believe that this is realistic. Why not realistic? Because experts believe that it is not possible to agree with Russia. Who can join this contingent? The most optimum situation is the participation of representatives of the United Kingdom, the US, and uh, Poland, and the Baltic states representatives. And we asked about the list of countries, participants of peacekeeping operations, and uh, uh, for what list Ukraine and Res Russia can agree, both of them. So experts were not able to mention such countries. They say Germany, but only a mm, small number of people said about. So also the experts believe that uh, uh, there, sh uh, there will be um, disarmament and uh, um, also establishment of um, uh, control over the border uh, will be done if uh, this is the defense uh, issues and also uh, political issues uh, concerning the Minsk agreements and also there could be some uh, lifting of sanctions uh, from uh, Russia, at least partially, in case of introduction of uh, um, peacekeepers in Donbas. And uh, negotiations with Russia are going to be difficult. Uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, what can we discuss with them or what cannot be discussed with them. And uh, the interesting issue uh, about uh, special status of these regions, Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast, that are those parts that are occupied by Russia and the militants, uh, majority believes uh, that we should not agree with the status and about elections without transition period. Here, experts uh, were um, categorically against this. Uh, so um, about negotiations, uh, uh, when uh, the opinion split 50-50, half of experts believe that we can negotiate it and others believe that we should not negotiate these issues. Amnesty of the militants 50-50, one, uh, one part of experts believe that we can speak about it uh, on some conditions and others believe that uh, there shouldn't be negotiations on this. Uh, mixed. Uh, uh, police forces, uh, the representatives of the UN and uh, local forces. So uh, uh, these uh, and local representatives, so mixed forces. And here, opinions differ. Majority of uh, experts believe that it can be implemented uh, in um, some conditions, and uh, other experts believe that it shouldn't be done and why they formulated like this. This was uh, implemented in Croatia and uh, in South Slavonia, and uh, this is um, a step-by-step -step reintegration, and it was done due to this mixed missions. So this is brief uh, survey, and uh, we decided to invite uh, specialists and we want also to hear your questions. This is not the first meeting, and uh, we will launch a national survey as well on this issue. I would like to give the floor to Alexander Fyodorovich Mozek, who is now the representative of Ukraine uh, in the group of uh, uh, political issues in the Minsk process. Uh, he negotiates with the Russian side and indirectly with those whom we do not want uh, to present uh, and uh, uh, who are also at that table. He is an ex experienced diplomat. He was the uh, deputy minister of foreign affairs and he was an ambassador to Poland, Turkey and the United States. Alexander Fyodorovich, welcome. Thank you. And also, we studied together. So, so the issue of introduction of peacekeeping forces to Ukraine is really important today. All we know that in connection with the occupation by Russia, of Crimea and the Donbas and uh, the annexation of Crimea, there exist uh, several negotiating processes, several formats of negotiations and a lot of forums uh, where negotiations take place. I mean the Normand format and the Minsk process. In each of these formats, there are five uh, negotiating forums, uh, the Normand Forum. Uh, these are negotiations at the level and consultations at the level of the leaders of the four countries, Ukraine, Russia, Germany, and France, and the ministries of uh, foreign affairs. Second, diplomat, uh, uh, advise, diplomatic advisors, uh, and uh, the Konstantin Yelisev is, is participating, uh, and the deputies of these advisors and the political directors or the uh, deputies of the ministries of foreign affairs and the Minsk process. There is a contact group, and in the framework of this uh, contact group, there are five working group political, the uh, security, uh, humanitarian, and economic. So negotiating process is difficult, you see that three years have passed, 
but the goals that were set are not met. And for us, it is uh, that uh, the integrity of Ukraine is not restored, the war is not stopped, and there is no full sovereignty of Ukraine over the whole part of, of parts of its territory. So the uh, introduction of the peacekeeping forces, the task of this is to help us in a peaceful resolution of this problem. And uh, in order to uh, uh, free these territories from the aggressor to restore territorial integrity and sovereignty. We remember that first Ukraine addressed in uh, um, uh, in March and, uh, 2015, and uh, Russia was against, and now Russia has its own concept of peacekeeping, and it is uh, really limited. If we compare to these uh, um, concepts, uh, Ukraine believed that uh, peacekeepers should be in all occupied territory of Donbass and in Ukrainian part of uh, Russian and Ukrainian border and have full access to all the facilities and to all parts of the territories. And uh, if we look at Russian concept, this is uh, uh, freezing of the conflict, uh, not uh, the placing of um, peacekeepers. Uh, yes, uh, peacekeepers, but with limited functions, the defense of special monitoring mission of OEC. So, uh, this is the freezing of the conflict, and uh, we believe that this is uh, uh, not with what we want. So there are two proposals, what to do next. So there we should hold consultations in UNO, because uh, UNO deals with these uh, issues, and the main uh, word is uh, uh, given by the Council. So, uh, first, we should have consultations with our closest partners, the three, uh, United States, um, Britain, and uh, Germany. We also should hold consultations France. Uh, and plus Germany as the participant of uh, the Norman process, and uh, also other countries, Canada and other countries, and the members of the Security Council, 15 nations, and uh, the most difficult is to carry out consultations with uh, Russia. And only when we will have some understanding, the next step will be uh, to um, invite uh, uh, the assessment mission to Ukraine, and then the, the um, secretariat representatives uh, and uh, the representatives of uh, different nations that should come to Ukraine, to Donbas, and uh, to understand uh, what is needed for peacekeeping forces, what number is needed, what weapons they should have, what equipment they should have in order to carry out this mission successfully. And after Secretary General will send to the Council the report of the mission, there will be the further uh, consultations with the members of the Security Council about the mandate for the separation and uh, the countries that will take part in the separation. And uh, the main issue are consultations and negotiations with Russia, whether this mission is real or not. The issue is really difficult and uh, Uh, the probability, as for me, is not high, but uh, at the same time, uh, in some conditions, Russia uh, also can agree for this operation. But first, there will be complex um, negotiation process the essence of uh, this peacekeeping mission is when we see that it will lead 
to the goals that we have before us. So the restoration of territorial integrity and full sovereignty over the whole occupied territory in Donbass. And uh, also speaking about Donbass, Ukraine will never forget Crimea as well. And when we speak about the restoration of territorial integrity, this is the also the restoration of uh, sovereignty of Ukraine over Crimea. And also we believe that uh, there are different opinions in Ukraine, but uh, the government of Ukraine believes that, that sh this should be done uh, through peaceful, democratic uh, way. So this is uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, so uh, what are the conditions? Uh, in what case will Russia agree on this? As of today, Russia is close to feel sanctions full scale that were introduced uh, by the United States and the EU. And uh, officially, politicians in Russia say that sanctions uh, do not harm much Russian economy and its position, but uh, sanctions are really efficient. And Russia and uh, Putin, uh, in his views, uh, they do not have the prospects uh, of development without investment and uh, technologies uh, from the West. So the West can live without Russia. Of course, there are some issues that should be dealt uh, with uh, uh, together with Russia, but Russia cannot uh, uh, live uh, independently without the West. So the sanctions, they should continue, and not only uh, to continue, but to be reinforced if uh, ma the Minsk agreements won't be implemented. So I'm speaking about territorial integrity of Ukraine. So at some stage, Russia, uh, even now, they think how to lift these sanctions, and in this context, there is a probability that at some stage they can have compromises and uh, to allow the peacekeepers to come there. So this is a difficult issue, and to negotiate with Russia is really difficult, really difficult, maybe uh, more difficult than f uh, with any other country This is for Ukraine. And once again, I would like to say that probability is low, but uh, there is such uh, probability, and um, we should work on this issue in order to have this mission in Ukraine and uh, taking into account those red lines I've mentioned. So as a diplomat at the beginning and at the end of the speech, I said that probability is not too high. So I would, I would like to give the floor to uh, Maxim Palamarchuk, expert of the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. First, I would like to say that uh, here I am as an expert, not an official, speaking about peacekeepers, why it is really important. The issue of Donbass and its occupation and the conflict there, the main thing in a strategic sense is not only that these are lasting uh, military actions, but also the fact that uh, the other side can escalate the conflict any time. As we see, the intensity of uh, military actions decreased recently, but everyone understands that any time it can increase. So despite the mandate of uh, peacekeepers, this issue is the demonstration of some fatigue of Russia from sanctions. As my colleague mentioned, so Russia uh, may um, 
uh, so this um, opportunity, uh, of course, Russian army stays uh, there, at, and uh, uh, there were training um, uh, uh, West 2017, but the political price uh, of intrusion and political uh, price of escalation under the mask, they are different. So the second point, the problems, uh, Russia has problems because of Western sanctions, but from the other side, Russia do not have prospects for development in such situation, but they have a prospect for long life in these conditions. And the Russian regime, for them, the, uh, the um, they do not want to repel, but they want to get the benefits uh, if they uh, retreat. So uh, the task, the position of our Western partners will be to limit those unofficial preferences and the opportunities of influence uh, in these uh, territories that uh, is occupied by Russian mercenaries. But there will be compromises. And here we have a third issue. I believe that the biggest threat from these compromises is not that they are not beneficial for Ukraine, but that there can be inadequate uh, domestic re reaction. As uh, recent events have shown uh, in the Supreme Council, mildly speaking, there was a serious reaction on the initiatives that were considered as two uh, uh, as uh, those that include too more, uh, much compromise. So uh, the reaction was uh, too big, and this is the biggest threat. So the main thing we should understand that uh, we have moral superiority, but it doesn't mean that we uh, should not make compromises. It is difficult to um, uh, understand, but we should um, leave the field for maneuvers for our partners. So one of the biggest threats in this negotiating process is the domestic situation and destabilization, possible destabilization of the situation in Ukraine if uh, there will be some compromises that uh, some politicians will believe that they contradict uh, the interests of Ukraine, and some people will say about treason, and uh, uh, also experts would disagree with some issues. And uh, uh, the, um, some things narrow the opportunities, but from the other side, they provide opportunity for our diplomats to say that, yes, we are for this, but you see that the, the, there is a parliament, and uh, there it is impossible to take such decisions, and we have democracy here. And uh, together with the Institute of the World Policy, we prepared a, a small memorandum uh, that was called Red Lines, uh, uh, concerning the Minsk agreements, and uh, uh, they outlined uh, what Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian diplomats disagree with. So these are elections, uh, special status. So now these uh, issues are lifted, but uh, what will happen if this issue concerning uh, peacekeepers uh, will be discussed? Now I give the floor to Sergei Solotky who is deputy director, and several days ago, this institution was called the Institute of the World Policy, and now it was renamed, uh, is renamed, this is the center of uh, the new Europe. So, uh, so this is your first uh, meeting as the, uh, in the uh, new 
Uh, so thank you very much for this survey of uh, opinion. Uh, so it is important uh, uh, to see the views of uh, people and to, to um, and here we see that uh, in the majority of questions there is full agreement and uh, consensus among experts. And I've tried to analyze uh, the uh, conditions in which this mission can take place. Uh, so this is the uh, political will of Moscow, whether to allow this uh, mission that can really restore uh, sovereignty of Ukraine. And I would like to uh, speak about the benefits uh, uh, if, but if the main goal is not achieved and the uh, Security Council, uh, 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 whether the Security Council can adopt such decision. So uh, I would like to say about uh, three items. First, you informed on this. This initiative looks legitimate and desirable in the eyes of the majority of uh, Ukrainians. This is 60 percent. So you, we may say about social uh, of public support of uh, uh, this idea of uh, Ukrainian power and uh, uh, peacekeeping uh, um, is looks even better than the Minsk process. And we compared the numbers and uh, the Minsk agreements are supported only by 12 percent of Ukrainians. On, uh, so 60 percent and 12 uh, percent, uh, this is big difference. So uh, whether you believe that uh, Minsk agreements will lead to, so the majority believe that there is an issue here. So I would like to illustrate our, from our experience. In 2014, the as experts from our centers uh, traveled throughout Ukraine, especially in the south and the east, and they spoke with local journalists and politicians. And uh, uh, the only question was how to re uh, re reinforce the defense of Ukraine. And uh, Professor Geran participated. Um, and there was a discussion in Zaporizhia, and uh, the residents of Zaporizhia asked when the president will ask uh, the peacekeepers to come to Ukraine. And professor tried to explain to them why then, and even now, this mission is unreal. Uh, we can invite, but Russia will block this, because Russia is uh, not ready. And we do not know for how long it won't be ready uh, for this peaceful regulation of the conflict between the states. And um, here we can see the chronology uh, of taking a decision on a peacekeeping mission. First, uh, uh, the president uh, said about it in February 2015. It happened after the Minsk Protocol, after September, and after the uh, uh, agreements in 15, and after the Balsava was occupied. So practically, the power understands that uh, it uh, exhausted all possible means to reach agreement in the format that they had and uh, uh, wanted to implement the initiative uh, that was criticized. The president then criticized this peacekeeping operation in Ukraine. So this issue for two years uh, was left without response from Russia. It was ignored or criticized. So. I would like to go back to two other functions that uh, uh, in this uh, uh, peacekeeping of um, so this is the uh, in response of uh, uh, expectations of our partners from Germany France uh, they say that they understand that uh, uh, their influence in li is limited they do what they can but uh, please um, uh, um, help us. Uh, Russia should show its uh, real face, and uh, Ukraine agreed to, uh, to create an international tribunal on the brought down 
going, and uh, the response of uh, Russia clearly demonstrates they blocked the initiative, the only country in the world that blocked it. And Russia is categorically against, uh, uh, against the presence of uh, international observers at the border. So if uh, 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 if you are just a mediator in the uh, domestic c conflict, why you do not allow the observers to be present uh, on the border? So uh, these um, issues uh, show who the aggressor is, and maybe uh, this should be shown to the people uh, because uh, Russian factor still uh, works, the uh, peaceful initiative of Ukraine is important, and uh, the uh, rejection of Russia shows uh, the real character of their policy. And here there is a third function. Uh, this is it reveals uh, the aggressive character of Russian Federation. So. The, uh, and Putin distorted the initiative of uh, uh, our country, but uh, it didn't convince our uh, partners. Uh, it uh, have shown that it has shown that um, he is not ready for peacekeeping mission, even the format he proposed himself, and uh, maybe Ukraine would agree on this that the peacekeeper should be at the line of contact, but uh, maybe Putin would find uh, some uh, preconditions and would uh, not allow this initiative to happen. And the conflicts were initiated by Russia in the post-Soviet states, uh, and we see what peacekeepers uh, are good for Russia. Uh, this is the presence of Russian forces in the zones of conflict, and here, Speaking about international context and the response of Russia, I would like to show another situation and to show another parallel. In Moldova, uh, recently, a political elite was active uh, uh, concerning reform of the peacekeeping mission, and uh, they want to uh, replace Russian soldiers on uh, uh, UN forces and these proposals from Moldova came at the level of UNO and we see that Russia now tries to maneuver in two directions and Ukrainian and uh, Moldovan and here I would like to say about our analysis that we had three years ago we wrote then that in Moldova and the Transnistria, uh, the mission should be uh, replaced, uh, and uh, this brought response from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russian Federation. And uh, usually they do not uh, provide uh, official reaction, and here the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia said that we uh, are those who want to ignite fire in the region. So uh, summing up, when Ukraine is condemned that it uh, respond, uh, uh, but do not initiate. But in this case, Ukraine initiates things and uh, it uh, uh, forces Russia to respond. And also in confirmation what I've said, whether this uh, peacekeeping mission is possible, studying the documents on peacekeeping missions developed by UNO two years ago by independent group, a report was prepared concerning the reforms of the missions and analyzing of the previous missions. And this group is brought to conclusion that this operations are efficient if there is a political will to peace. And we do not see it in Russia, and I do not see grounds for this mission to appear and be efficient now. So about political will, I participated uh, uh, in one discussion uh, with, together with Alexander Hug, who, who is uh, the um, uh, deputy head of the monitoring mission of OEC, and uh, he said that if there is uh, political will, 
So, uh, so if there is political will, so there will be zero violations at the line of contact. But we see that Putin wants escalation or de-escalation in order to uh, pressure us and our um, partners. So I have a lot of questions myself, but I would like to give the floor to the journalists who are present. So we have 20 minutes for questions. Do you have questions? Please introduce yourself first. So you're working in tandem. Good and bad police officer. Andrei Megil, Institute of Liberalism. I have several questions. Uh, one question to Irina Bekeshkina. What was the sampling? Uh, what about the views of these experts? Uh, and, uh, and another is uh, to question to uh, former ambassador. What should be done uh, at the international level? Because a lot of people, a lot of people believe that uh, uh, a lot of things are connected with the sanctions. But some people believe that uh, if sanctions will be li uh, lifted, there will be better economy. So the experts, these are people who have publications uh, on international issues, who express their opinion on international issues. Part of people, as I've said, uh, were from the public council at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, we asked more people because uh, we had uh, limited time. We didn't phone those experts who didn't respond. Usually when we have more time, we call and we insist, but it is rather long. And for you to understand how this uh, database of experts is formed, we have uh, experts who participate uh, um, in our surveys. We uh, send questionnaires to them, part of them respond, part of them do not. So when uh, some surveys come to me, you just choose what is more important. Uh, sometimes you just lack time to do it, this. So here we have the names, you can verify it. So I would like, uh, speaking about my experience, I was an ambassador to the United States uh, at the times of revolution and when wo war broke out and uh, the times were difficult. And uh, um, I am as ambassador and our staff, uh, we worked 24-7 uh, every day to organize uh, the support of the United States to Ukraine and uh, diplomatic and military support. And in order that the United States also uh, brought uh, the help of Europe at this high level. So uh, diplomats work a lot to uh, on the nature of the on uh, on the conflict and bringing this idea to uh, the west that this is not internal this is international conflict and the west should uh, contribute to restore international uh, law and uh, to re because international uh, law was violated and uh, there should be a restoration of uh, uh, the uh, 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 sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine and uh, uh, the Helsinki Act. And uh, yes, there are limitations on trade with Russia, but there should be contribution of Europe in order to pressure Russia. And your opinion uh, that uh, uh, European business suffer from sanctions and that uh, the economy of Russia do not develop because of the concept that was introduced by Putin in uh, uh, many uh, things. And uh, this is sound opinion and we should speak about it. Now, uh, several words about the efficiency of the peacekeeping mission. First, it can be if there is high level of support by the West. Without the West, we won't cope here. Uh, first of all, the United States, and second, the European Union. And uh, it will be efficient 
when it will be implemented ba based on the basic principles we are speaking about, the control of the uh, whole occupied territory and the closure of the border in order uh, to stop uh, the to stop bringing ammunition and uh, uh, regular forces to uh, stop this movement uh, without closure of border there won't be any efficiency of the mission uh, yes we should uh, work on uh, support of the West and the uh, rigid support, and uh, the United States and the European Union, they um, support our approach to peacekeeping operation, and uh, we uh, should create the situation uh, to create pressure on Russia to uh, make this uh, mission possible and to, to restore territorial integrity and sovereignty because you can have uh, territorial integrity but uh, weak uh, influence on the territory. So there should be full sovereignty of Ukraine. Thank you. So your question, please, Anna Kalushna, 24th channel. So I have millions of questions, but I will ask several of them. So uh, everyone expected that in the documents on reintegration, uh, there will be several uh, lines of peacekeeping operations. And now politicians do not speak about it. This is the first question. Where should these points be included when it will be adopted by Parliament. Second, I know that Russia submitted to you an O their resolution uh, on the mission, uh, th their view on the mission, and uh, it looks like Ukrainian power consult with the partners or the enemies and then uh, they submit. So why it was not done? Why? Won't you present our view in order to have uh, an alternative, an opposition uh, uh, towards the Russian view? So, so uh, these people who tortured our uh, servicemen or who committed crimes against humanity, they may not be uh, punished if there is uh, amnesty. So some people, they participated in uh, political games, but not those who committed some crimes against humanity. So first about uh, um, peacekeeping, there are such lines in the law. I forgot the second question. Why they didn't submit? proposals. Yes, Russia provided the resolution, but we see the response to this resolution by the United States, Germany, as partners of our partners, and France as the permanent member of the Security Council and the Great Britain. So this idea uh, is supported, but about the content, the main players supported our position that the peacekeeping mission should be present in the whole territory and uh, should uh, have the control over the border. So, so this is not about submission, this is about uh, to submit early. The most important thing is to get support. So our diplomats and the permanent uh, representative, uh, rep uh, representative office, we have consultations in order to agree the main parameters with our closest partners. Of course, we should uh, uh, negotiate it with Russia, Germany, uh, with uh, f uh, France in Germany, and with the United States, Canada, and other countries in order to have understanding that we will have their support. And then, when this process is completed, I believe that then, formally, the proposals will be introduced and the uh, draft resolution will be also uh, submitted. So the draft resolution 
uh, usually is submitted by uh, several countries. The problem is not to submit, but to have joint uh, a document uh, um, as, uh, as it was with the resolution uh, on uh, territorial integrity in 2014 and the resolution of the General Assembly on Human Rights in Crimea. So these are the joint draft resolutions about the amnesty. Uh, who wants to answer about amnesty? You know that the law was adopted on an, uh, amnesty. It was uh, voted but not signed. The situation is clear. Those who committed crimes, who killed, who tortured and uh, committed other crimes, they will be outside this uh, uh, amnesty. Only those uh, who took arms in their hands but they didn't, who didn't kill, didn't torture, and um, There should be proper decision taken by the court in each case, and only after this uh, amnesty will be possible. So I would like to say, you know, these things that are not popular in Ukraine, and uh, they are not popular among experts as well, and uh, uh, special status and uh, elections without uh, proper uh, transmission periods. So uh, the scores are really low in our survey, and this is a natural response uh, of experts and people. So uh, what uh, we can uh, agree or do not agree, but this is in order to say uh, that Ukraine is ready for compromise and Western partners say we understand everything, but we should speak with our businessmen, with our, pol with our political uh, <coughs> opposition, and uh, uh, there is responsibility of uh, Ukraine and uh, of uh, Russia and how the OEC mission record these uh, violations. SMM OECE, if uh, that side shelled us, this is a violation. If we shelled in response, this is violation as well. So in this situation, we should demonstrate and uh, our Partners ask to provide more arguments and uh, about the uh, laws, about uh, special status that was not implemented. This is uh, some sort of game. This won't be implemented. We understand that in a year there won't be bringing out of Russian forces. And it is said this preventive measure is uh, said there. So these are unpleasant things, and there is emotional response on this. And uh, for me, it is not pleasant to hear about the special status transition period, but this is part of the uh, diplomatic game. So I will say unpopular things about the amnesty. This is the uh, this is not popular idea. So those people who led arms, uh, so who didn't, uh, so if these people, they take arms in their hands, maybe they killed our people and uh, they are separatists, they violated the law. Those who fight uh, on the side of Ukraine, they, uh, they uh, wage war legally. So, uh, if we have, for example, 30,000 people, will they be sent all to prison? Maybe this is not possible. What will they do if they, if, for example, there is an agreement with Russia? What will these 30,000 people do if they believe that they will be in prison? Well, uh, maybe they won't uh, uh, get rid of their arms. Maybe they will fight until the last breath. So there should be amnesty, and uh, this is pardon of uh, the criminals, those who committed crimes. But we should have a differentiated approach. So those who tortured, who, who humiliated people, who was uh, really cruel, 
maybe we should study it case by case and in each case if for example this is a simple um, fighter uh, who shoot maybe the amnesty is possible this is my personal view and i understand that this is unpopular view so when we come to this no one will understand how it will happen and when it is going to happen i would like to support uh, Ms. bikeshkina and uh, Amnesty is the practice of uh, end, uh, ending these conflicts. Uh, so, so this person may continue fighting or to go to prison. So uh, it is difficult to convince this person uh, to uh, lay arms. Everyone wants um, justice, but. Uh, are we ready to sacrifice the lives to punish someone? So if he killed something, if uh, someone, if uh, he uh, got amnesty, then maybe he won't kill other people. But if we uh, try to follow this person, if we try to fight him, maybe this will bring um, other victims. So um, we can have an, uh, a, a historic analogy. Maybe uh, not many people know when Stalin fought uh, Russian uh, uprising army, uh, Stalin fought Ukrainian um, uh, uprising army, uh, they, there were some um, cases of amnesty. These people, they integrated back into society because he understood that it is a too costly to fight to fight them uh, to uh, fight against uh, those people who lose uh, lost their hope so uh, this i would like to ask one question to mr mozak so where do you sit there in minsk do you speak with the representatives of lpi and dpr how it is going on there so, according to the signed documents, the protocol memorandum and the complex of measures and declarations, the participants of the negotiation process in a legal sense, this is Ukraine, Russia, and OEC. It is said in in the preamble of the protocol that was signed on the 5th of September 2014. And it is said that that uh, trilateral contact group is created, uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia, and OEC are the mem members. So uh, here, Russia is not an intermediary, as uh, they say to the world. and. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, here in Ukraine, some people also repeat this argument, but uh, the issue I asked, I asked a question to Russian delegation. If Russia is intermediary, who fights with whom? Uh, we with uh, OECE or, uh, who, uh, or the OEC is the intermediary. So in the legal sense, there are three participants of trilateral contact group and these documents they assigned the protocol the memorandum and the complex of measures uh, there is a signature of the Harchenka and plotnitsky our argument and based on this russians uh, say that they have the same participation as this three members so our argument is that by their signatures the Harchenka and Plotnitsky they confirmed what was said in the protocol that the participants are trilateral group so I when I conduct negotiations I always bring this argument so the negotiation process is really difficult it is psychologically difficult some 
Times we say that uh, this is the first third trench, so Crimea, Donbass, and uh, this negotiating process. But we should continue, and uh, before, uh, and you know that sanctions are connected to the Minsk uh, uh, agreements, and uh, as some uh, politicians uh, advise that we should go out of this process, but you know that. Then the policy, uh, politi uh, policy will be different, and part of the sanctions will be uh, cancelled. That's why we should continue this process of negotiations, and we should uh, our clear. Uh, we should have our clear goals: the restoration of territorial integrity and sovereignty over the whole territory of our country. So. You can ask your questions off records. Thank you very much for being with us. Goodbye. Thank you. In several minutes, we will have the